Hello again. In this lecture, we're looking at chi squared tests of independence. So the idea here is we're looking at two-way tables. We've got tables that uh, have two categorical variables, essentially, and we'll test to see if these two variables are independent or not independent. And this is an important concept. So you, I might want to test, for example, if the blood sugar of a person is independent of the blood pressure, or if the cholesterol level is independent of, of blood pressure or of, of sugar level or other such measures of, of, of the patient's uh, you know, physiology or whatever else. Uh, I might want to, to take a look at whether the house price of a person, how much the house is worth, uh, is independent of their salary or interest rates, those kinds of things in business cases. So lots of examples in biology and in medicine we'll take a look at afterwards in genetics as well. So take, let's take a look at the example here. Often we have data that arises from two categorical variables, and what we want to know is from the joint table of frequencies, I take a look at how many houses I've got in my data, and what the price or the value of the house is, and what the salary of the people who bought the houses is. I've got frequencies available, and I want to investigate if those two variables are associated or independent. And this two-way table is called the contingency table. So here, let's take a look at a simple example. I've got a manufacturing facility, and it has three different machines, each of which produces the same product. But I want you to know here if the proportion of defectives produced by the machines is the same or different. And here's the data. So if proportion of defectives is the same for the machines, that means defectives is independent of machine. Essentially, if I call the proportion here P1 and P2 and P3, I'm testing essentially the hypothesis that these are all the same. Which means essentially saying that the machine and the proportion of defectives are independent because they're all the same, and H1 saying they aren't all the same. Not all P's are equal. In other words, they aren't all equal. I might have two machines being the same, but not the third. Or I might have them all being different. But certainly they are not all the same. So this saying proportion of defectives is the same essentially means that the proportion is independent of the machine. Oh, oh, the oh, proportion of goods, oh, good or bad is independent of machine. So that's what I'm looking at. So what I've got here is a table of observed counts from data. What I'm going to do is actually work out an expected or mean frequency once I assume the null hypothesis, because that's how we usually work. We assume null hypothesis, work out things from there, and see what we get from there. Then I'm going to work out some kind of test statistic based on the observed and the expected frequencies, and then I'm going to do some work from there to work out the statistic. The assumption in the method we're going to use is that the expected frequencies must be at least five. Now, all the examples we'll see here will actually have that, but there'll be some later on we'll see that they don't have that. If that's the case, we have to pool or merge or combine until we get this, this, this particular uh, criteria satisfied. We may see some of them afterwards. So the hypothesis I said was, is always going to be H0 is to two variables are independent, and H1 is saying they are dependent. We might some, 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 sometimes say are associated instead of independent. Uh, so the two variables are not associated. And we might say here, these two variables are associated. Now, the expected frequency, let's take a little tackle here, is observed comes from data. The expected frequency in itself is going to be calculated assuming independence. Now, we saw independence previously in the last lecture. So here, that's what we'll be looking at. The idea is this. I've got some data here. I've got some column and some row. So column J and row I. 
and I've got some observed frequency A O I J. I've got a column sum and a row sum. Now, the probability that I'll be in this row here is going to be probability of being in this row is the row total over the grand total. And probability of being in the column here is going to be the column total over the grand total. So, proportion of observations in this column here, a CJ out of total T, proportion of observations in the row here are the RA over the T. That's a probability of some kind, essentially. So if I use my ideas of independence, the probability of being in cell IJ, probability of being here, should be the column and the row probability is multiplied. That should be CJ times RI. And so that's going to be, uh, uh, write them in terms of the totals. That's CJ over T times RI over T. And that's the probability of being here. So the number in that cell, what I'm expecting to see in that cell is the probability of being in the cell times my total number of observations. That comes from binomial. Probability times total number of trials. So that means it's going to be CJ over total times RI over total times another T. And you can see one of the T's here cancels off. So I get the expected frequency in my cell IJ in row I and column J is the row total times the column total over the grand total. A simple calculation. And that's all I've said in this slide over here. The expected frequency is row total times column total over grand total. So then the test statistic is worked out by taking a look at the difference between the expected and the observed and divide and the expected. Now the reason we divide by this is that if I'm comparing numbers say 10 and 20 to 1,010 and 1,020. The difference here is 10. The difference here is 10. But this first one is a larger difference because this is essentially doubling the number. Or the difference is actually 10, as the proportion is quite a large difference. What is here, the 10 isn't such a large difference anymore because proportionately it's very small. So the comparison of numbers should be based on just the difference between the numbers but also their actual values. And so that's why we're looking not just at the difference here between the numbers, but also the actual values as well, and that's measured by the expected frequency. Now, this particular test statistic here has a chi-squared distribution. This is called chi or chi, the square. This is chi-squared distribution. And the parameter here we're looking at, when we're looking at Poisson and Barnumble, we had parameters there, means and N and P and so on. Here there's something called a degree of freedom. This thing is a degree of freedom. And that's given by the number of rows minus one and the number of columns minus one. We'll see this quite often happening, this minus one thing happening quite often in many statistics, many census. So here this is the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. And this chi squared distribution is a continuous distribution. So we haven't, we have seen this briefly, and we know that continuous distributions probabilities are worked out by looking at areas, and we'll see that as we go through. Let's look at the example over here and see how this works out. So I have here the same example as before. I'm going to look out at 5% level of significance if the proportion of defectors is the same for all machine or not the same. So the hypothesis, as we said before, is proportion of defectives is independent of machine is H0. That essentially means proportion is the same for all machines. And H1 simply says H0 is false. That's the simplest way of writing this down. Now the table here shows me the expected frequency. So I've got what I've done here is I've got the totals for the rows and the columns. So this expected frequency over here is worked out by the row total, which is 48 times the column total, which is 200, divided by the grand total, and that's 580. 
Likewise, this one here is worked out by the row total, which is 48, times the column total, which is now 170, divided by grand total, that's 580. And they all worked out in the same way. So the brackets contain the expected frequencies. One thing you'll notice is that if I add uh, these expected frequencies, I'll get 48. And if I add them this way, I'll still get 200. So the row sums and the column sums are also maintained, observed, satisfied by the expected frequencies. The row sums and column uh, sums will be the same. So in other words, if I work out this number and this number, and I can work out this by difference. So I just add these up and subtract from 48. And once I have this number, I can work out this one by subtraction and so on. So you might see some of these in the lectures. But the idea here is I can work out these frequencies in this way. And my calculations are given over here as an example. You can find the rest of them. Now then, the observed value of my test statistic is the difference between the observed and expected squared over the expected. The important thing here is and the order of subtraction here doesn't matter because the squaring will make everything positive. But this needs to be very careful. This is division by the expected frequency. So all we're doing is taking each cell and subtracting the observed and expected, squaring it, but then I'm dividing by the expected frequency. So that's what I've done here. And my calculations for each of these are given here as well. And that's an important thing to look at, the calculations, and we'll see afterwards. That comes to 6.9554. So how do I then perform my hypothesis test? So I now take a look at the degrees of freedom for the chi-square distribution. Is the number of rows minus 1, and this is rows minus 1, number of columns minus 1. I've got three columns and two rows. So that comes to 2. So my chi-square distribution is very skewed. looks something like that. This is chi-squared and this is 2, and so my value here is 6.9554, and I find the p-value from R, and you'll see that later on when I do the example in R. So I find the p-value in R, and that area here is the probability, and that comes to 0 0.0309. So that's less than my significance level of 0 0.05. My rule is still the same. If the p-value is less than significance level, I reject H0. So I have got enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis at the 5% level of significance. So I'll conclude that proportional defectors is not the same for all machines. So that's how the chi squared test is performed in this case. My decision here is proportional defectors is not the same for all machines. So I've made some important decision over here regarding proportional defectors from the machines. So the question then is, if it's not the same for all machines, which machine produces the largest number of defectors? So I take a look at that calculations for chi squared. You find the largest difference here, the largest number is 4.4709. In other words, the largest discrepancy between observed and expected frequencies, assuming independence, is in this 4.47. This is a second cell in my table. I look at the second cell in my table. There's this one here. That means I'm actually expecting 14 defectives in this case. I've actually got 22. In other words, I'm producing far more defectives here than I should. So machine 2 produces more defectives. 1 and 3 are fine. That's all I've said over here. Machine 2 has a much larger or higher number of defectives than expected. So that produces a higher proportion of defectives. So not only have I decided that the machines aren't all the same, I've also identified which is the worst. So I can take some action to fix that now. All right, as another example, I've got another one here. This is exactly the same in form, but I've got three locations now with customer service, and I've got the number of successful and unsuccessful calls, exactly the same situation. I want to decide if 
the percentage of calls that are success successfully resolved is the same for all locations. Now, while I'm with this uh, subject of uh, proportions, many people will take a look at these numbers and convert this to percentages straight away and work with percentages. The problem is, if all you have is a percentage, you don't have the actual sample size. And sample size makes a big difference. As we saw earlier, if I toss a coin 10 times and I get 6 heads, then 60% heads. If I toss the coin 1000 times and get 600 heads, there's still 60%. But those two situations are very different. Extremely different. The larger sample size for 1000 means that 600 heads will actually tell me that my coin is biased towards heads, is unfair. But a 6 out of 10, there's no issues with that at all. So, how do I do this? Well, I can do this in R. And so, the way it works in R is going to be simply, you go to R, and we can use R commander here. And if you go to statistics, you can take a look at the contingency table, and it's going to be enter the two-way table. So, I can actually enter this. So, it... it by default gives me this. I can change the number of rows. The data I had here for the uh, call center, I'll use that one here, I had two rows and I had three columns. So I can increase the number of columns to three. And I enter the data here directly. So what I had here was 257. In the second cell I had 264. The third, I had eight, uh, 283, sorry, 283. Down here, I had 43, 86. Oops, too many. And finally, 97. So that enters for me the table. That's all right. That's okay. So enter the table here. Now, so... If I go back to statistics and my table again, what I want to print out here is the components of the chi squared test, expected frequency as well. I want to print those out so I can see what's going on here. If I now press OK, what I'm getting here is, if you look at this, I've got The first thing is the p-value. So that tells me that I've got a significant result. In other words, my hypothesis here would be that the percentage of proportion of successful calls is the same from all centers, and the alternative is it's not the same. So here I'm deciding that all the call centers don't have the same proportion of successful calls. So by taking a look at my chi squared components, you can see what's going on here. Here, I put the calculations done for me as to what the chi squared components are. I look for the largest value, and the largest is 7.91. That tells me that that's the cell where I have the greatest difference between expected and observed. So I now compare the expected frequencies and observed frequencies. My expected counts in that cell here. Expected is 65. What did I actually get? 43. So I, I, would sh I should actually get 65. I actually have 43, which means I've got a lower number here of unsuccessful calls than I should be getting. That means that the best out of these is location one because it gives me a lower number of or lower proportion of unsuccessful calls. So again, I've done the work here. First of all, I've concluded that all the centers are the same, and then I further identify the center that's the best. So one gives me the best service, two and three are the same, not as good as one. That's all. Thank you.